As it turns out, everybody, rebranding comes at a cost. Hello. I'm Merc TV. And I am flooded with issues today. As you see, there's no cam now. Why? No clue. There we go. All day today. All morning. Technical issues. Hello, again. Merc TV. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? Hello, Erica. I saw you there, but now my multi stream's not working. So, if you could blow up the text chat, it would mean a lot to me. <laughs> I can't see any text chat so far. But again, all of these issues come from changing the URL on Twitch and on YouTube. We are Merc TV now, guys. No longer Merc Radio. We're growing up. We're growing up. We have visual elements. A lot of visual elements. You know, this tumbleweed is one of them. For you listeners out there who still just listen, that's fine. We have a better microphone set up so that, you know, it's not quite as roomy, hopefully. Hopefully we sound, hopefully I sound good this morning. And again, I want to hear from you guys. How are you doing today? Did you have a good weekend? Have you been enjoying your time? I had an excellent weekend. I didn't do anything. I took naps while Lux game streamed. I meant to game stream and I didn't, I didn't play anything. We worked on our stream setup and really happy at the Alex Murdoch rabbit hole vi uh, plays. So we're going to do our best to kind of keep down the rabbit holes if that's what you guys are feeling are some internet rabbit holes well i do that a lot i go down a lot of internet rabbit holes and uh let's just keep doing that together this russell dermond mystery the topic for today drove me nuts Became a big fan of Eric Allen. And Eric Allen on uh, on YouTube. Let's see. Let's find one of his videos here. Oh, do I not have one pulled up? Boom. Anyway, we'll watch that toward the end of the, of the stream. Eric Allen has some excellent... Uh, theories and ideas as to what's going on here. Remind you guys I'm in the Discord too, so hop in the Discord and hang out with me. Oh, Let's double check make sure everything's rolling smooth. Yeah. Good. Put a big ol' hay in there. See if it shows up. There we go. Good. Good. Make sure my streams... Make sure my, my chat's working. I want to hear from you guys. Um, I pulled up some some printed word on this case just to give us an overview. We, we got into this a little bit at the end of, of yesterday's stream, but... Again, we didn't really... Scratch the surface on on speculation anyway. I just kind of introduced a little bit of the Russell Dermond mystery with an Eric Allen video, and then we went off stream, as I recall. Let's see here. This is titled, Five Years Later, Sheriff Still Agonizes Over Brutal Cold Case Murders. So this would have been from 2019. Again, the case happened on May 6th of 2014. I'll just go ahead and read this. On May 6, 2014, neighbors of Russell and Shirley Dermond, an elderly couple who lived for 15 years inside the Reynolds Great Waters Gated community, home to some of the country's wealthiest citizens, called 911 to report a gruesome discovery. The body of Russell Dermond, 88, was inside the garage of the couple's 3,200 square foot home. 
slumped behind one of the couple's cars. There was something else, a detail that would propel this case from a local murder mystery to a national whodunit. Russell Derman had been decapitated, and his head was nowhere to be found. Shirley Dermond married for 62 years to the retired clock manufacturing executive and fast food franchisee was also missing. Her body would surface 10 days later, discovered about five miles from her home by a couple of the by a couple of fishermen on Lake Oconee. An autopsy later revealed Shirley Dermond, 87, was felled by two, maybe three blows to the head with a blunt object. They were deep wounds, signaling an unmistakably lethal intent. Strange. Strange. And it doesn't seem like anybody in the town had motive. There's not a motive to be found. These were nice people as far as we know. I uh, have here some of the follow-up news reporting. Let's see. News reporting. Some of the follow-up from the news load this up there we go Welcome back to DBL. For the past five years, a double murder has haunted a Georgia community. An elderly couple was killed, beheaded, and dumped into a lake. It's the only unsolved case What's in up, the county. Brian? We have an update in True Crime Chronicles. Russell and Shirley Dermond lived a happy and good life. They were married for 63 years and enjoying retirement at their secluded home in Lake Oconee, Georgia. That particular spot, that cove where they had was, was really private. That privacy has made it even more difficult to catch his parents' killers. Five years have passed since that unimaginable day. Pat, I'm getting 911. Yes, I have an emergency. Okay, I think I have somebody dead. May 6th, 2014. A friend makes a frantic phone call to police after checking on the Drummonds at their home. They discovered a gut-wrenching sight. 88-year-old Russell Drummond beheaded in the garage. <coughs> they don't even know how he was murdered because we don't have his head. 10 days later, a fisherman discovers 87-year-old Shirley Drummond's body weighted down with cinder blocks. She was in the lake about five miles from the family's home. It's the horror that they must have gone through. That's what's so, so difficult to, to overcome. The Drummonds had no outstanding debt or enemies. Nothing was stolen from their home. The killer's motive has stumped Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills. I have utilized the resources of the FBI. But we've had no shortage of people wanting to help. He's convinced two or more people conspired and carried out the killings. We may not like how long. We're going to see a lot of footage of, of Sheriff Sills today. They take, but that will be solved. And earlier, Tori, Lindsay, and Brandon spoke with a journalist who spent months investigating this cold case. Take a look. We are joined by investigative journalist Jessica Knoll with Volt Studios in Columbus, Ohio. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. This is the only case the sheriff has not solved in his 44 years in law enforcement. Why do you think our investigators having such a hard time? One of the major things is there was very little evidence left at the scene. You know, their house was left almost untouched. It was immaculate and there was no fingerprints, no foreign DNA. So there's a lot of roadblocks. Um, and one interesting point about the community they lived in was a gated community. And typically there are cameras. Right. And there had been a storm earlier that week that knocked out the power. And so there were no cameras. So they don't even have that kind of evidence mm. to look at to see who was coming in and out. So it could have been any. A little bit of detail. We're literally having to go back in time. This is why we don't have, this is why we have so little a trail of evidence and who was coming and going out of a gated community. We should know, you know, it's a gated community. You pay extra for that kind of security as I, as I understand it. It's just truly unfortunate.
anyone at this point. All right, Jessica, you also spent a lot of time with the sheriff investigating and revisiting the crime scene. So in that moment being there, what still sticks with you about this case? He took me out on Lake Oconee uh, where Shirley's body was found and it's this beautiful serene area and I think just that juxtaposition of the horrific things that happened to this couple um, in such a beautiful place in Putnam County um, really sticks out for me. One of the things found, it was intertwined in a wound um, on Russell's hand, was Shirley's hair. Oh, now, wow. Shirley, as you know, was not found with him. Oh. Uh, he was found beheaded in the garage, and she was then later found 10 days later in the lake. Hello, Flannel. Uh, that's a horrible detail. They found her hair in his hand. He was trying desperately to stay with his wife. That was his last stitch effort, a heroic mm. act of love wow. for his wife, trying to shield her from whatever was, oh you know, gosh. being used to kill her. And you also drove to Florida to speak with their son. So what does he think the motive was and who does he think is responsible? You know, he's kind of just as clueless as the sheriff is at this point. And I don't say that in a negative way. He just has no idea because his parents were just loved. They were grandparents and they didn't have any enemies. He's told me that he feels confident that if anyone's going to solve his parents' murders, it's going to be Sheriff Sills. Thank you so much, Jessica. Now to read more on this case, visit 11alive.com. 11alive.com. Uh, we've actually already read a little bit of press on it. It's just some of the details, but those are big details. Lux is home. What up, lady? Hi. What you doing? What you doing at home? Oh. I forgot something. Oh. Gonna... Oh, gotcha. Well, welcome back, Lux. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. All right, next up we have an actual, uh, who is it from? Let's see. It's the most frustrating case. Of this is Inside Edition talking to Sheriff Sills about this case. Again, this is one that he, out of his 40 year career, he's never been able to solve this one. And that's tough. It's the most frustrating case of my career. It truly bothers me. These people certainly didn't, weren't deserving. And I, like nobody's deserving of this especially at their stage in life. Uh, certainly the biggest uh, murder investigation in my 44 year career. Why would someone decapitate Russell Dermot? Putnam County man was found decapitated in his million dollar home. 88 year old retired man living out his golden years with his wife in a beautiful lake community in Georgia. His wife was found days later floating in Lake Oconee. Authorities still don't know why it happened or who did it. You think I'm frustrated to the point of giving up or something like that, that damn sure isn't the case. No, but what worries me the most is these, whoever did this is still out there. And anybody who will do this will do it again. If they didn't do it before. Ooh, that was a good intro crawl. I'm Howard Seals, I'm the sheriff of Putnam County. Mr. Derman was 88. His wife, Shirley, was 87. Been retired uh, for over a decade, living there in that home. They didn't show up for Kentucky Derby party that they were supposed to show up for. They're off in the Kentucky Derby. After a couple of days, their friends had called them, friends that lived in the same area. Uh, they finally went over to the house to see about them. The house wasn't locked, walked in the house, walked all through the house, couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, eventually, uh, the man uh, of the couple went into the garage, walked down into the garage itself, and discovered Mr. Derman's body, uh, minus its head, uh, lying on the floor of the garage. He had been decapitated. It was a post-mortem decapitation. He was already dead, of course, when this occurred. Miss Durbin was nowhere to be found. Hmm. See, that's the part to me that's insane. They they haven't found his head. I don't. I. We didn't know where Miss Durbin was. There was no evidence of forced entry. There was no evidence of any struggle. Approximately ten days later, uh, Mrs. Durbin's body surfaced. Uh, in Lake Oconee, about six miles away from their home. 
she had died as a result of uh, multiple uh, blunt force trauma to the head. Uh, and her body had been weighted down with two cement blocks. So they're singling out Russell Dermond. And like Salentium pointed out in the chat, a trophy. Now, Eric Allen on YouTube, and we'll play his video here in a bit, he has a very interesting theory as to why they took his head and what that means, the significance of it, but it attaches to a very specific religious group as to why he did it. So not necessarily trophy as a way of, more of a way of desecrating the soul after the body dies, is Eric Allen's theory, but absolutely Salentium. Uh, that was my first thought was trophy. Why, uh, but again, very specific. You, Why would you take home the head? You only take home the head of your enemy, right? You that That's the concept. Yes. Uh, you know, you would you would display something because you don't you don't like him, you know. Again, they found Shirley 10 days later. Uh, and the reason they found Shirley was in this part of, of, of Lake Oconee where they live. Well, where they found her anyway. Uh, but there's parts of Lake Oconee where there's high tree trunks. You know, there's tree trunks that go all the way up to maybe two, three feet before the water's surface. Uh, and then they're just trimmed trees that have been flooded over. And, you know, in, in Shirley's case, her body was hung on one of those. And as the search teams were passing, or as fishermen were passing over the surface, slowly driving through these, you know, tree trunks underneath the water, they, they saw her there. So if it wasn't for this unusual, what is it, aquatic topography, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have found Shirley. They they took the measures and the, the, these, they, again, the fact that there's bricks and boats and bags involved, this implies more than one person, in my opinion. This is a group of people committing this act. And, you know, honestly, it's it. Uh, thank goodness for that strange tree trunk situation in Lake Oconee. See, so this is the house, you know, right here where we, we pulled up. Mr. Dermer's body's right uh, right behind these two doors right there. I mean, that was taken the day. I took that photograph the day. Uh, this where you pull into the driveway and they place these uh, towels here to keep that blood and fluid from running out of that door. As far as suspects, we still don't have any suspects maintenance workers, yard workers, uh, people like that, their children, their adult children. We've uh, uh, found out where they were on, at the time. Uh, uh, we polygraphed them. Uh, and then we interviewed uh, hundreds of people. We simultaneously, my detectives, with, along with the FBI, and uh, detectives from other sheriff's offices interviewed uh, over 200 people one day. Certainly never done anything like that before. You know, the Dermans were not controversial at all. They lived a, a, a very sedentary life. Uh, they went to church. Uh, Mrs. Derman uh, played bridge at the local bridge club. He had stopped playing golf. Uh, he, he walked on a routine basis uh, and uh, other than that you know I've got every canceled check they've written for the last eight years their credit card records everything there's no reason that we can determine why anybody would be, have ill feelings for them that's why all. I'm uh, that's why I'm so confused by this we don't we there's no seeming there's nobody no motive no Dirty money trail, no dirty paper trail behind Russell or Shirley, no overspending from shirt, no, no motive, no motive for even an internal conflict where, you know, somebody stands to inherit a, a great deal. None of that. You don't see, and you have a strange, you have the strange situation of a decapitation, but an obvious group of people committing a crime, you know, I read earlier that in a, that that is a fascinating thing about this case is that when you see something like that a dismemberment that's an intimate situation that's typically one two people committing the crime 
but this genuinely feels like it would have had to have been more than two people who did this, who did this. And without robbery being a motive, I don't, it's still, this is just so baffling to me. It's, it's actually to the contrary of that. We know of nothing that was disturbed in the home. We know of nothing of any great value that was taken. There was no evidence of a struggle. And quite candidly, we can't really say. Well, and we have Brian wondering about motive. I think we are all wondering about motive. And uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up again. It's the lack of motive is <laughs> makes the actions themselves seem that much more baffling. Well, again, you have an intimate dismemberment. You have uh, these. Uh, this is so so strange. Say that the murders occurred there. We think he was shot uh, in the head because we developed some gunshot residue on his shirt that he was wearing. So, again, see, now you have overlapping overkill, and, and is, this, is this revenge? Is this a hit? Is this, you know, this times when you see more than two people dismembering somebody typically there's cartel or gang behavior involved right there's gang activity i don't see evidence of any of that uh behind russell Durman's life so why why this ending you know exactly salentium very similar to the clear water case um one of yeah. the most exclusive but violent. communities in the entire hyper violent over violent Georgia, if not the nation these are gated golf communities with beautiful homes, beautiful landscape ground. It's not the only thing like that we have in Putnam County, but it's certainly the most prominent one. But in this particular neighborhood, there was we had no crime, other than a few uh, cases where uh, somebody took something out of somebody's car, you know, or something like that. Uh, we don't have any incidents at all. I mean that that. We have alarm calls and things like that, but they're always false alarm calls. That's the Dermot's house there, but like I said, there are new people living there. We'd had a storm when you walked into the You have to know where you're going to get to this home. You have to want to, You. this is a specific address these people targeted. This wasn't a random, I think again, like the, the chances of this being random are out the window. I might be wrong, but I feel like there was a reason they chose specifically Russell Dermond and Shirley Dermond. The guard shack, as I call it, the monitors are there, and you can see the cameras are working. You know what I'm talking about? But we'd had a storm about two weeks earlier, and it wasn't recorded. Hadn't recorded since that storm. But if it was somebody who was supposed to have been there, you know, it wouldn't have been, you know, it would. It wouldn't have mattered. Security's a lot tighter now since this happened than it was at the time. And, uh, but if they came by boat, you know, could have been anybody from anywhere. So I think the matter of Mr. Thurman's head being removed uh, had nothing, his, the body was not positioned in any ritualistic manner. At some time, uh, I didn't totally discount that she might not have done. Not positioned in a ritualistic manner. That's from Sills himself, who was there and saw the crime scene, was chief investigator. Uh, hmm. Body not placed in a ritualistic manner. That's just something that I'm just building my own notes, you know. Don't get me wrong, she was 87 years old. But I mean, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you that... I didn't have to take that into consideration because where was she? They'd been married forever. There was never any evidence of any marital discord or anything like that. But no issues with the I marriage. I began to wonder, you know, maybe she had been, you know, part of it in some way. Of course, that totally dissolved when we, when we found her body. I'm right to tell you the about the murders of Russell and Shirley Durbin. They were crimes of passion and were committed by at least two people. 
you should not rule out people in law enforcement or people. Absolutely. Okay. This is interesting by at least two people. Um, so far, whoever wrote this letter that he's reading, uh, if he pinned this himself again, he's right on with how we're feeling about this independently. So living near the couple, we get letters, we get emails, we get phone calls from people. But then you have things where, you know, you, know, you have psychics call, you have, uh, you have people that call with just utter foolishness. This is a person who said they weren't a psychic, but they had certain revelations that they thought they had, and, and uh, they wanted to tell us that water had played a role in the case. It's just, we, we have literally hundreds of letters <laughs> like this or emails yeah. or uh he sure does sound like dr phil i uh <clears throat> something com comforting to me about sill's voice uh even when he sounds beleaguered it, which is on it's uh, he should feel beleaguered again look at that look at that stack of just evidence and call-ins and things. He said he had people, psychics calling in or people saying it, calling in saying it has something to do with water. And it's like, yeah, we know they live parked on Lake Oconee. <laughs> so this poor man's been through it with this case and it's the one he can't solve. Things of that nature. Somebody knows what happened here. And there's more than one person involved in this case. There is. There has to be. And what we need is that. There's an organization, I'm telling you. This is more than more than two people. Phone call. Definitely more than two people. Uh, real quick, if you guys, that, that phone number right there, anyone with any information about this, if you do happen to see this, please call that phone number directly. That's, I believe, this isn't, I believe, still actively being investigated. Sills won't let this go. As long as Sills is around, this case will probably, he'll take information on it. He's made that really clear in all the things I've seen so far. When are you planning to retire? Me? Yeah. Me? <laughs> Never. Is this case something that you're dedicated to finishing in your... Oh, sh sure. This is a case I'm dedicated, dedicated to finish this week if I can get the opportunity to do it. But I'm, I have no intentions of retiring anytime soon. Huh. I mean, I'm a good-looking guy like me. <laughs> Picture of you? Where would I go? Why would I retire? <laughs> so he's spry again we're gonna be watching some sheriff sills on this uh oof. all right let's get to the main shebang let's get to eric allen's theories on this Eric Allen on YouTube, guys. This channel right here. Compelling true crime documentaries. This guy hasn't copy <laughs> copy hasn't given us a copyright strike. He's been incredibly nice, uh, as far as I can tell. Anyway, again, we've watched more. We watched all of his Murdoch series, and we're gonna watch. Yeah, the, at the end of the last Murdoch rabbit hole stream that we did, we ended up watching the beginning or well, the first part of this two-parter here. But we're going to watch part two where he gets into theories about Russell Dermond and talks to Howard Seal Sills and really starts breaking down what he thinks happened. And let's I found it a compelling watch. I'll be honest with you, there's certain aspects of Russell Dermond's life I, I don't know. I was literally shaking in the coffee shop. I was so excited to have found something. Glock 90 millimeters, um, sawed off shotguns. And I pulled that little North American out and I cocked it. And I said, but I'm gonna send one of you to hell today. Seven years later, Dad Russell Dermond was charged with misconduct with a woman in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Y'all just don't understand how tough things are. I could be making a much bigger deal out of this whole theory than I should. At this moment, I'm not exactly sure what the connection is between the Dermans and Malachi Z. York, but I am determined to find out. Okay, again, we've heard some things already that work 
against Eric Allen's personal theory about Malachi Z. York and the Nuwapians being involved in this. Um, real quick, if you're a Nuwapian and this ends up in your lap, don't threaten me. I don't have a problem with any religious group. We are running through the theories. We're going down a rabbit hole. I'm not your problem. Uh, the Nuwapians can get really uppity, and I thought I'd just put that on here before we get too speculative. The only thing that you said there that interests <laughs> me is the proximity of that little town and it, it, if they knew each other some way many, many yeah. years ago. When you see ritualistic crime, they want it known that that's what it was. Yeah. People ask, was the body positioned some sort of way or something like that to indicate some sort of ritualistic association with the murder? It, it, it ain't there. Yeah. Or they want it known, like if they, you know, kill me, and then you know that's gonna be big news. Yeah. You kill me, I'm easy to kill. I mean, there could be somebody right out there. No, right out there in the edge of those pine trees with a rifle when I walk out to the car. Yeah. <laughs> Is it possible? Yeah, but is it likely? I don't think so, mm -hmm. okay? I just don't. Yeah. Not unless they knew each other or something. Now, if they knew each other, that'd put a different light on it. Last episode, we covered the circumstances surrounding the decapitation of Russell Dermond and the murder of Shirley Dermond in Putnam County, Georgia. We dove down a rabbit hole involving the Nuwabian Nation cult, its leader, Malachi York, and essentially three reasons why I believe they might have played a part in those murders. This episode will use my second interview with Sheriff Sills, an interview I did with a former member of the Nuwabian Nation, and new information I found when researching for this episode to see if that theory holds any weight. Lastly, we'll go over some new information that I found that genuinely could explain why these murders have been such a mystery for almost a decade. There's a history of violence in the Nuwabian Nation, one that even included a decapitation in the 80s when they were located in New York. Chuck Morgan was a member of the Nuwabian Nation from 1989 until 2011. I spoke with him as well as Sheriff Sills about the Nuwabian Nation and violence. I don't know if that was really kind of behind the scenes stuff that he kind of kept to the side or, um, or was there kind of a violent sentiment in the cult at all? I don't see, I don't see it as being the cult as a whole however mm -hmm. there were individuals that moved in in baltimore there were some individuals that were robbing uh jewish establishments the media started getting on it and they referred to them as the shotgun bandits mm -hmm. and no one knew who they were at nighttime they wear all black put ski masks on hoods with high-powered weapons glock nine millimeters um sawed off shotguns and rob people one of the guys was telling me all about it what they what they do and their justification was, you got to do anything for the mission. In New York, they had this big conflict with the Sunni Muslims. So there were conflicts. There were fightings on, on the street. There were stabbings. You know, York, it, was, it got so bad that York formed his own military force within the organization called the, um, at that time, referred to him as the Swords of Islam. They were the people who did a lot of the violent acts for York. So there, there was always that undertone of violence that was there. Again, that was always individuals who, from what I saw, took it upon themselves to do certain things for the quote. It wasn't mission. ever preached from the pulpit. No. Dumb asked me one day. Taylor was ten. My son was ten. He wanted to go to the world of Coca Cola. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't pay attention. To anybody following me that day, I just didn't. Yeah. And uh, the only gun I had on me, a North American Arms, 22 Magnum, oh, this okay. little, little uh, stainless steel gun. I had that in my pocket. That's all yeah. I had. Yeah. We went, and we still had several hours to spare. And it used to be down by the entrance to Underground Atlanta. So we go over to Underground. They used to have these old cars parked out on the streets, and I was bent over just looking at the tire and the wheel of the yeah. car. And when I raised up, I had... 30 or 40 of those some bitches around me. No. Yeah, I'm not exaggerating, to the point where people were looking to see they were completely surrounded me. Janet came out 
Clay was still young enough to hold her hand, stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Came out of the store, and I did like this. And she knew to get the yeah. hell. She got him, and she started down the street. Yeah. And one of them said, you enjoying your life today? And I said, you've got the advantage, boys. Y'all got me. I said, I'm getting ready to walk through you. And I saw Janet had made it to the out of sight. Yeah. And I said, you've got the advantage. You can kill me. And I pulled that little North American out, and I cocked it. I didn't point it, but I cocked it. I said, but I'm going to send one of you to hell today with me. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and I said, so whoever wants to go to hell first, grab hold. And when I did that, I just walked. I never pointed the mountain. Yeah. I just walked right through them. And I walked Hello, out. hello, hello, everybody. And that was the only time I was ever scared of them at all. So yeah. maybe, maybe, the, um, maybe. Yo, Sheriff Sill's story is, uh, I mean, I'd be pretty spooked. I can't see I'd pull a gun. But they didn't like Sills. They specifically had literature out. They were sending him threats and stuff. So there is some background behind that. I suppose if we, if you're not coming clean off of part one of this story, Sills might seem like he was being a little overboard with his reaction. But there's a history of, of them threatening violence to him and his family. So he had genuine cause for concern. Never pointed it at anybody. He just definitely concerned. Maybe picking on the defense. So it's a group that scares scares people uh, in that area. They have committed crimes in the past. At this point, though, with the New Opians and what we know, just what we know about the crime scene alone, I feel like maybe Eric Allen is chasing a bit of his own. He's he's chasing confirmation bias to try to put it on the New Opians, which is totally fair, in my opinion, because because there's just such little in the pool of suspects that somebody like Eric Allen would see the new Opians and immediately think that. Now, again, I'm interested in crimes they've committed around that area because we're talking about things they did 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago in New York, not near Lake Oconee. So what have they done? Have they done anything near Lake Oconee? I don't know. Senseless was um, much more easier than yeah. um, fighting force with force. That makes sense. Um, if if any angry New Obians are watching this, I am highly <laughs> armed. <laughs> Just want to let you guys know. These interviews really did help give me context into the New Obian Nation. And from here on out, I do feel it's more fair to say a member of the New Obian Nation may have committed this crime as opposed to saying the New Obian Nation did. The second piece of evidence that I found was the timing of the murders in relation to this video and a comment made on it about beheading. I couldn't find any more information on this, but I did a little research on the commenter and I sent that information to Sheriff Sills. Lastly was some really interesting information I found out about Malachi York and the Dermans living in neighboring towns in New Jersey at the same time. Here's where we get a little bit interesting. And like Sills said, if you can prove that they knew each other, that might change things. But. Years before they lived in Putnam County, Georgia. When I found this bit of info, I immediately messaged Sheriff Sills to speak with him again. Two days later, we drove from Beaufort, South Carolina to Putnam County, Georgia. I want to share the journey of discovering the Dermond and York connection as I didn't really go over it in my last video and it's going to offer a really interesting insight into how tricky it can be investigating these cases as well as be a springboard for another theory that I'll go over later in this video about why the Dermond murders might be such a perplexing mystery. It all started when I stumbled across an article saying that Malachi York grew up in New Jersey. I knew that Malachi lived in New York before moving to Georgia, but didn't realize that he had actually grown up in Teaneck, New Jersey. New Jersey is also where the Dermans are from, Hackensack to be more specific. Hackensack and Teaneck literally border each other. I had to keep digging. I found this newspaper clip showing the address for Russell Dermond at 271 Williams Avenue. Here's where things start getting a little confusing, guys. And this is where Eric enters a rabbit hole that I like to call 
A Tale of Three Russells. Uh, let's let him continue. They lived there in the late 50s and 60s and maybe longer. Then I found this article listing Malachi's address as 245 Coolidge Avenue. He moved there in 1957, meaning that he was there at the same time that Russell and Shirley were. I typed in Malachi's address to see how close they were, and my heart pretty much fell out of my chest when I saw that they lived half a mile from each other. I thought to myself, there's just no way that this is a coincidence. There has to be a connection somehow. I was literally shaking in the coffee shop. I was so excited to have found something. But this is where you have to be really, really careful and make sure that you do the research to present accurate information. There's a few things to unpack here. First off, I later realized that there are two 245 Coolidge Avenues less than four miles apart, one in Hackensack and one in Teaneck. Malachi lived at the one in Teaneck. I assumed it would bring me to his address when I typed it in maps because I just never considered that there would be two the exact same street addresses so close. Yes. So the Dermans and Malachi <clears throat> didn't live half a mile apart, but still pretty close at just four miles. But next, I kept seeing inconsistencies with news articles that would mention Russell Derman. Inconsistencies regarding his age, when he was married, etc. Long story short, I found out that there were actually three Russell Dermans living in this area at the time. Three Russell Dermans. Guys, there's three of them. A tale of three Russells. There was Russell C. Dermond, born in the early 1900s, who we're going to call Dad Russell Dermond. His son, Russell J. Dermond, who is the one who was decapitated in Putnam County, Georgia, born in 1925, who we're going to call son Russell Dermond, and a third, also Russell C. Dermond, born in 1936, who we're going to call mystery Russell Dermond. Here's where I have a bit of a gripe, Eric Allen. Why are we calling the third Russell, the Russell we know everything about, mystery russell you have a photo of that man you know exactly when he was born but you're gonna call the first like there's literally the mystery russell is russell number one am i wrong guys sorry when i first watched this it drove me nuts i'm like what is up with eric's why did you why 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 name him like that <laughs> it's not mystery russell this is mystery russell up here and then there's two Sun Russells. I don't... As for most of my time researching, I had no idea how he was connected to the other two. We will get into that later. Mystery Russell Dermond was actually the one who lived at the 271 Williams Avenue address. He was somewhat of a local celebrity as he competed on the U.S. Olympic team in 1956 and 1960. For example, in 1956, just a few months before Malachi moved to the area, the mayor declared a day in December as Russell Derman Day. <laughs> the papers also confused both younger Russell Dermans, as I found multiple instances of them talking about the mystery Russell C. Derman, the Olympian, but referring to him as Russell J. Derman. Two Russells, very confusing with their names. Russell C. Derman, why don't we call him Olympian Derman? <clears throat> Olympian Russell. 30s Russell. I don't know why he's mystery Russell when we know so much about him. He was an Olympian. He had his own holiday in New Jersey at one point, Russell Derman Day. Which is the son Russell Derman's name. I did find the real address for son Russell Derman at the time, and he lived pretty much the same distance from Malachi as the other one. So long story short, they didn't live half a mile from each other, but York did live within about four miles of two Russell Dermans while he was living in New Jersey. Then again, years later, lived a few miles from a Russell Dermond in Putnam County, Georgia. I don't know if Malachi York had anything to do with the murders of Russell and Shirley Dermond, but I just had to keep digging, and I did find a few more interesting things back in New Jersey. When I continued to dive down the Russell Dermond rabbit hole, I was shocked to potentially find the connection between mystery Russell Dermond and the other two. Dad Russell Dermond had separated from his wife Margaret in 1929 when son Russell Dermond was only four. Seven years later, Dad Russell Dermond was charged with misconduct with a woman in Fairlawn, New Jersey for an incident occurring on March 28, 1936. What? It doesn't say what the misconduct was, but I think we can speculate. That's when I remembered that mystery Russell Dermond was born that same year. 
1936. I quickly did the math and nine months after March 28, 1936 would be the very end of December 1936. Looking up Mystery Russell Derman's exact birthday, I discovered that he was born on December 31st, 1936 in Fairlawn, New Jersey, nine months after Dad Russell Derman's misconduct with a Fairlawn, New Jersey woman. What? I think Mystery Russell Derman is also what? the son of Dad Russell Derman, <clears throat> but with a different mother. Mr. and Mrs. Adolph Springle were listed as Mystery Russell Derman's parents in multiple articles, leading me to believe that they adopted him at some point. I found the addresses during these times to be really interesting as well. In the 50s and 60s, the Dermans lived across the river from the York House. But in the 30s and 40s, they actually lived on the other side of the river, much closer to York's family house. I found two addresses, one for when son Russell Dermond lived with his aunt and mom after they had left his dad at 403 Leonia Avenue, 1.8 miles from the York House, and the other for dad Russell Dermond and presumably son Russell Dermond before his parents separated at 24 Westervelt Place, less than one mile from the York House. And this time I double and triple checked everything. These addresses are accurate. So could I find evidence that Malachi York or anyone in his family interacted with or had any type of relationship with one of the Russell Dermans? No, I yeah, just probably couldn't. Not. But it really wouldn't be hard to imagine that their families crossed paths or that they knew each other at some point. Even Sheriff Sills had a difficult time finding info on his early life as well as finding information about the Dermans. So they, they did live there at the same time too. Yeah, I'd have to go back. I, I, look, I, I'll be honest with you. There's certain aspects of Russell Durbin's life I, I don't know. There are no records at all of U.S. time nor its precursors. They don't exist. There's no records of what? US no business records of the company he worked for. They just simply don't exist. I was, I was wondering because I couldn't find Well, you're not going to find I was I looking. I was like, what? Fuck. I'm the Sheriff Sills went on to talk about how frustrating it was to dive into the past of Russell Dermond or... Well, there's where the mystery is. Where did Russell's money come from? How did he have the money to retire? Why did he go from New Jersey to Lake Oconee, retired, uh, having while working for a clock company that doesn't exist and franchising out of McDonald's? Or whatever. He's a fast food franchisee. I don't think it was McDonald's, but there might be a motive. See, Salentium, I believe within this, this financial obscurity, there's probably a motive here. Really anyone else that he investigates, as oftentimes other agencies just don't keep records. Y'all just don't understand how f***ed up things are. Yeah. People, these no police problem. agencies, no nowadays, so. throw away their f***ing records after 10 years and shit. This folks so frustrating. Yeah, and I guess there's no way to get records of like all the employees that were no, the franchise. No, anything, they're just but, gone. Yeah. No, and, and again, everywhere they had a franchise, I called the police department, Union City, Jones, all these little suburbs of Atlanta, yeah. and none of them, not a single fucking one of them have any records from me. Huh. None. And I run into this every day. I'll call t and pack and sack and, but I, uh, I'll do it but I, yeah, I'm, I'm not optimistic but. <laughs> Malachi York spent his time getting in trouble when he was in New Jersey but wow. the records just don't give us much information Dwight was uh, he's arrested. ghosted they're, they're charged twice when he was 18 um, two separate occasions one for burglary and one for yeah. statutory rape I've uh, got those records do you? is that something well like, let me say this I, uh, no I've got the fact that he did it. Okay, yeah. No, I have no idea who he raped or... Okay, no. yeah. No, I'm not a clue. Because I was like, I could file it for you, but let me just ask Sheriff Sills if it's even worth it's it. Not or there. It's not there. No, just, just get rid of it as quick as you can. No, Nobody wants to... Work. Nobody wants to work. While I got as far <laughs> as I could looking into the Nuwabian Nation theory, there was another theory that really started to make me think. In light of the info I found about multiple Russell Dermans, could this murder be an instance of mistaken identity? 
What if the killers were after Russell C. Dermond, but killed... Why did he go off in this direction? Because it's... I mean, no, you just were... you, Eric, they just... <laughs> all of his records are gone. All of his financial history might be a lie. It... If it it was definitely son Russell, second Russ for it was Russell J. Dermond that they whoever it was thought it it has to be attached to the money. This crime and this organization, it has to be attached to this massive amount of money he had to retire on with his wife. But there's no you can't find proof that he even had a restaurant franchised. You can't find proof that the clock company he worked for even existed. Like killed Russell J. Dermond. Why did Eric go off on this? Maybe it was mistaken identity. Like, what? Instead. This would explain why the police couldn't find any motive for the killing. There really wasn't one to kill Russell J. Dermond because that's not who they were really after. Maybe they were. You don't know anything Russell about C. Russell C. J. Dermond. Do I have any tangible? He knows way more about Russell Russell C. Dermond than he does J. Dude was an Olympian. I could tell you. You could probably find rec more record on how mystery Russell retired than evidence to support this Sorry. theory? I don't, but outside of it explaining why this case is so mysterious, I also saw that Russell C. Dermond passed away almost exactly one year later, on May 9th, 2015. I don't know if the early May date is of significance, but maybe the killers realized they had the wrong one and corrected their mistake about a year later. All I could find on Russell C. Dermond's death was that he died, quote, suddenly. Which could be something as simple as a car accident, but on May it also 9th, means something more just a scary. year later. The second video took forever to make. Not because what you see in Weird. the video was incredibly hard to create, but I found myself wanting so badly to solve this case. I kept feeling like I was right on the cusp of finding some bombshell piece of information that would open this case wide open. And one never came. I kept digging and digging and digging, but I could only uncover so much. At the end of the day, I don't know what happened to Russell and Shirley Dermond, but somebody does. There's still so much mystery surrounding this case, and I think it's important to keep all possibilities open. If you know anything about who may have done this, or you played a role in it yourself, I'm asking you to reach out to the police, or even me <laughs> if that makes you more comfortable. I don't know if that will work on criminals, for friend. Family, not only for the family of Russell and Shirley Dermond, but for you as well. This case went a very different direction than I originally thought it would go. I know it got a little wacky involving ancient Egyptian alien cults and such, but I don't want to lose the humanity of this case. He involved that, by the way. I don't, again, I've, there's nothing about the Nuwapians and the Dermans that there's no connection there. He just thought he could find case, one. Or get distracted from what it is really all about. Russell and Shirley Dermond were peacefully living out the last moments of their lives. They had been married almost 70 years and were enjoying the fruits of their hard work, watching their kids raise kids and savoring the last moments they had on earth. I know there can be a temptation to think, well, they were near death anyway, so is it really that sad? But I really don't see it that way. Think about how precious time will be towards the end of your life. Knowing you have a limited amount of something makes it that much more valuable and precious to you. Their last years were taken from them. Potentially the last thing that Russell saw was the love of his life, the partner who had been by his side for almost 70 years, the woman that he raised kids with, being drug off to be brutal. Mafia connections, perhaps. I can't get over the, the assumption that it's mafia connect, connections that... The new going from New Jersey to Lake Oconee, the massive amount of money with no trace. This photo here of him being very New Jersey. <clears throat> I can't help but think that maybe he was attached to a mafia in some form. That's where his money it's came from. Short of a genuine tragedy. This series was on the Dermond murders, so I covered the Nuwabian Nation as just a part of that story, but I've got so much incredibly interesting information and content from my research and interviews with Sheriff Sill. Now he's just into grilling the Nuwabians. He really likes getting that Nuwabian heat. Uh, all right, guys, we have one more piece of news that's actually, this, this came out two months ago. We have a little bit of an update on this whole Dermond case.
before we get into speculation and stuff, it says, uh, the FBI is now sifting through data in the 2014 Lake Oconee double homicide. Let's just, let's see what the news said about this two months ago. This is the most recent thing I could find. It's from May 7th of 2022. Now to the horrific murders of a Putnam County couple in their 80s. It's haunted the community and their family for eight years, but tonight there is hope for justice and more answers as cutting edge technology could finally solve the almost decades old homicides near Lake Oconee. 11 Alive's Don White joins us live now here in studio with the breaking developments and reaction from the victim's son, Don. Joe, I spoke to the son of Russell and Shirley Derman just hours ago. He is hoping and praying new cell phone evidence can help the family learn what happened in the final moments of their loved ones' lives. We spent a lot of time together, close-knit families. That change for the Derman family on May 6, 2014. Uh, I have an emergency. A neighbor made this 911 call after finding the decapitated body of 88-year-old Russell Derman in oh. the family's lakeside Edenton home. Then fishermen found his 87-year-old wife's body, Shirley, 10 days later, near a dam about five miles from the home. Obviously, mom and dad at that point were mid, mid to late 80s. If, if there was an enemy out there, it would have taken place you know, a lot, lot, lot sooner than that. Brad Derman is a victim's son. He says their murders would think. make no sense as the couple had no known enemies. Items of value that were left in the house, not, nothing was taken, you know, that kind of thing. Not this a robbery. This case is always on the mind of Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills. It's been eight years, I'm sorry. This is the sheriff's first unsolved homicide in his 48-year law enforcement career, but there's hope. Thanks to new technology not around when the murders took place eight years ago. The FBI's... Uh, I got the data, uh, I've taken it over to the FBI and uh, they are using a software program that they have and uh, we're going to delve into it and see what we find. Sheriff Sills has been anxiously awaiting the cell phone data. He hopes can crack the case and give the Dermot family some answers. We'll take this data, we'll identify who's in the area, see who they are, you know, see what kind of backgrounds they have, see who they've contacted and uh, eventually start uh, tracking them down, interviewing them personally. That person with that little sliver of, of uh, knowledge could, could come forward at this point. That'd be very much appreciated with our family. Man. So we know they're going to go through cell phone data and they're going to do their best to track their movements. Uh, there has to be something more behind the financial history uh, a USA clock, apparently that doesn't exist. Or USA time or US time. Let's just Google it real quick. US time. Let's see. Company. There's Timex group. Which maybe he, maybe it had changed over time because I, maybe it's, USA Time Incorporated is what it probably was. Founding timeline and milestones. No, Timex has been Timex. Let's see. Waterbury Clock Company. Okay, that's when it changed. No. See, I don't... I believe Sills when he says he can't find proof of that clock company. So weird. All right, guys. Today we have kind of a big day in the news, don't we? I know we had, it looked like some live stream coverage of the Nicholas Cruz trial. Nicholas Cruz is finally going to trial. Uh, it looks like we're getting it. It was a disciplinary hearing today. Is that is that my correct in, in assuming that? Uh, so we'll probably pop over to a whole other stream and try to pack some titles in today into News Dump. Break things up a little bit. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, and while I have you here... Merc TV is brought to you by Death Wish Coffee. If you go to 
pillar.io slash Merck TV. You'll find our boom, our death wish copy, our death wish copy link. You'll also find my music and the merch store. Also find a discord server invite right there at the bottom. Boom. You want to hop in the discord? You want to be a part of the stream? Come on in here. The death wish coffee guys. Merc TV is brought to you by the world's strongest coffee. Did you know that? You got to check out this espresso roast. <clears throat> It'll keep you going. It'll wake you up. It's like drinking lightning. It's also delicious coffee. Eric, shout out Erica. Erica just recently got a bag of, I believe, their blueberry vanilla dark roast. Check it out, guys. Deathwish Coffee, pillar dot io slash merc tv it's not merc radio anymore guys it's merc tv boom also all the social media links you need to know how to find me that's how you find me uh and i'll see you guys around the corner we're gonna just do another stream today i'm gonna do another one but i wanted to go down the russell Dermond rabbit hole with you guys i can't move forward with content today without Dedicating a video to Russell and Shirley Dermond. Rest in peace. I'm sorry that happened to you. And I hope they I hope we can find out who did it. I hope some justice comes to the situation. I can't help but think there's something going on with the fight the lack of financial records or lack of records on Russell. There has to be something there. there has to be something there. But maybe we'll do, maybe I'll do some digging myself and who knows, maybe some edited content on this situation's coming soon. So stay tuned to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Smash that thumbs up for me if you're still in here with me. It really helps with the algorithm. And I'll see you guys in a matter of minutes. Bye.